I get asked a lot of questions about the Nagamadi and I haven't posted anything for a while so I'm just going to look on the computer. Um, one of the things I was asked about was the number of times is where did they get the 72 from? Well it's in the book on the origin of the world and if you look at the original translations that were done by the scholars I think they are the far superior version because they keep tweaking them and dumbing them down you know to hit a bigger mass market but anyway chapter sorry paragraph 19 says and before his mansion sorry before we get into this you may I think the Gnostic library online has probably got it so I checked that out. Uh, I downloaded my version, I don't know how many years ago now, uh, and I think it's a superior version. And before his mansion, he created a throne which was huge and was upon a four faced chariot called Cherubin. Now the cherubim has eight shapes per each of the four corners, lion forms and calf forms and human forms and eagle forms, so that all the forms amount to 64 forms and the seven archangels that stand before it, he is the eighth and has authority. All the forms amount to 72. So there it is. But I think the mistake I made was in saying or suggesting or basically outlining it as a system of planes. I think that's wrong. That was quite an early translation and I've looked at it since. And I think it's all to do with the building of the constellations and the astrological houses. I think it reveals a celestial wheel which now sets down a new order of things around him, Yaldabaoth. And how he connects with himself as one above the seven. He is the Ogdawat, if you like, or the dweller of the Ogdawat, king of the seven. So, and before his mansion, which is an astrological house, he created a throne, which is an astrological term for a planet which sits on its throne when in a sign of which it is a ruler which was huge, it says, and was upon a four-faced chariot called Cherubin. Now, the term Cherubin means a child angel attendant on the Abrahamic God. So clearly, we're talking about Yaldabaoth. Now, the Cherubin has eight shapes per each of the four corners. Lion forms, which is Leo. Calf forms, which is Taurus human forms which is Aquarius, eagle forms which is an old-fashioned term under Vedic astrology which is super interlinked into all this I think very very strong um, Vedic connections was actually eagle forms the eagle was a symbol of Scorpio so that all the forms amount to 64 forms and seven archangels of the Hebdomad that stand before it. He is the eighth, the Ogdawad, which is the celestial wheel, the dome, the realm of the fixed stars, if you like, and has authority. All the forms amount to 72. So when you look up at the sky from the earth, it's everything you can see with the naked eye. So the earth was his footstool. So prior to this transformation in the story, um, I think you're dealing with a brown dwarf system, a dark system. The Archons are settled within that system. And then at that point in the story, he declares himself the one and only God. And that deeply upsets Sophia, who basically sets Sabaoth on fire, transforming his system into a system of light and capable of hosting all manner of organic life on the earth.
he reveals the matrix of the uh, she reveals the matrix of the human being so a lot happens in that and from that point on the archons know that a greater force existed than them and something existed before them so they're kind of passive to what's going on so that section i think is um let me just analyze it my interpretation is that the four corners are the four houses or star signs that appear fixed to the naked eye that's where we get the pillars from or the four corners they remain as if, as if they're holding up the sky they remain fixed to the eye in the northern hemisphere the eagle is an ancient representation of the sign of scorpio each house emerges from a cloud of galactic origin if you look at the original 21 of the major arcana suit the world card and that's what we're dealing with here now often overlooked in this card is the number 21 which in chaldean numerology means the crown of the universe achieved after many struggles and, str and trials and which no one shall take away here worn by the sometimes called divine sacred feminine at the center of the world now revealed i think as sophia she's replete with a garment draped across a figure in the form of a single helix representing her single female instructing principle in the form of the kundalini energy she brings it also states in this codex that two bulls in egypt hold a secret the sun and the moon i think that's the eclipse uh, being evidence and a witness to Sabaoth, namely that over them Sophia received or took control of the universe. From that day or age, uh, she made the sun and the moon. She put a seal upon her heaven unto eternity. Now then, looking on YouTube, right, another question I get asked. Um, so what is the soul? Um how is it different from the body and the spirit well in the texts you have a thing called a tripartite male or anthropos and the three constituent parts of you and i represent the three different levels so you've got the eternal spirit from which we get from the spirit realm which is ourselves the true selves you and i we are immortal eternal spirits that incarnate into a body which is called the soul and it's a bit like the human body in as much as you have organs and the sacred organs are, are of course the chakras and the blood system and the nervous system are like the arterial systems they're the meridians within the aura and the divine spark that sits within the soul is actually somewhere here but deep in in the head at the center of the head at about here because sometimes you see this kind of sphere cut off and it, it cuts off just beneath the knees and that's the spirit aura and it extends furthest from the body and that gives spiritual indication or indication as to the spiritual nature of the person so when someone comes close to you and you enjoy their company or their intrusion if you like or their blending with you there's a nice harmonic between um the two but if someone comes close to you and you might know why but you just don't feel you get along with that person then or there's a disharmonic vibration or something um that's when you get an indication as to their spiritual nature and, and either that not necessarily that there's something wrong with them but that you may not be able to blend with that person you don't like them close you get it on a bus in the office wherever it is you work and you think i don't like them being close to me or other people you, you want to get close to so it's that's that particular aura and the divine spark which sits there creates all the auras of the soul you have the mental and emotional aura which is like a nimbus or gloriosity around the head and that gives indication as to the mental and emotional um, state of the human being and then you have the astral body which is another aspect of the soul 
which is a replication and carries the blueprint for the physical body. It's a vehicle which we use to get around the spirit world, so rather the astral. And it's also how we're recognized when we come back through the veil, when you see spirits. In fact, sometimes spirits are seen with the top of the heads cut off and just beneath the knees and that they appear to float. It's because you're seeing them through that spirit aura. Then you have um, the chakras, which are the sacred organs, as, as we've said. Um, the most powerful one, of course, is, you know, people go on and on about the, the uh, crown chakra, which is the connection to the divine. But really, the Nagamati flips it on its head. The most important one is the Kundalini, the root chakra, because it sits um, where all the drives are. Uh, I'm not going to get into that just yet, but control of what's between your legs is essential to your spiritual development. You only have to look at the jails, don't you? And what causes arguments in the world and everything else. And the, and the Nagamati text completely nailed that, which is partly the symbolism of the um, Adam and Eve story. So that's what the soul is. And then, you know, we know what the physical body is. So the, the spirit, um, in the transformation of the solar system into a system of light and the transformation thereby of the earth into a bio um, world of biodiversity. Uh, Sophia revealed the matrix of the human being and the archons create the souls and the bodies. In fact, in the Judas Codex, it's quite clear, in fact, throughout the codices, that the archons control every human soul. And what that means is that they got into the matrix of the human being at various stages in our, our beginnings and altered the anthropos and gave us drives and things which we find very difficult to overcome, such as anger and uh, sexual drives and hunger and, uh, you know, th those types of things. Uh, but Sophia put in good things such as compassion and love and qualities of the spirit that were enharmonic with um, the values consistent with the spirit world. So the spirit is the control and it's when you allow this, the soul and the body to control the spirit that you're in trouble. And that's where the, the text refer many times and Jesus talks about many spirits led astray. And that's the message of the archons because the more they can destroy the spirit, the more you end up going to them when you pass over and they get to reincarnate you or to put you back into the vessels of light and they get to live longer because that's the whole message, if that makes sense, of the book on the origin of the world, that the longer they can destroy us and, you know, be kind of parasitic on us, the longer they get to live. So Sophia tricked them into creating the human being creating the physical body and the animating principle of the soul. Then through Eve and the Kundalini, she changed and altered the soul into something that would be capable of hosting a living eternal spirit, which is how we incarnate. And that's the one thing the Archons don't get. I don't know if I've got time in this, but the, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there about how the Archons can't crack the genome. Well, they, did, they, they wrote the genome the way past the genome, what they actually don't understand is how the spirit coming into the soul that they create and the body they create over those two planes that they dominate, how this thing comes in and animates it. Now, the reason they don't understand that is because, as the texts keep telling you, from below they are and from above we are. That which does not possess a spirit cannot take hold of a spirit. Uh, they are merely of the flesh and of the soul. So I hope I've answered quite a few questions there. I know it's a bit complex, but, you know, these aren't things that you just, you know, digest while you're reclining on your book or lounge. You're being hypnotized by YouTube and daytime TV or something for the rest of your life. These are texts that take a long time to understand, although you may just get them straight away. Is Jesus Christos? Um, no. Sophia and Christos are female and male, favour those things, and sometimes uh, they ent 
entwine. But Sophia, in creating our existence, did so without her male counterpart, Christos. But with the permission of the God of the entirety, big God, if you like. And I've read a lot of stuff, well, not a lot of stuff, I've heard more than I've read that this is all a mistake or some kind of experiment or something. But you know what, friends, all, all is known. Trees aren't experiments. Neither are blades of grass or um, a cat I've just been to let out <laughs> in the wind and come back in. Um, <laughs> so it, these things are beyond you and I to uh, comprehend because they're not made by any human being. So Christos um, is the anointed one and all those sort of things, but he dwells in the Ennead with Sophia, which is the ninth heaven above the Ogduat. So Jesus is modeled on the Christos Aeon. He comes to reveal you to yourself and your creator to you and that you will do all the works that he does and greater if only you would think do and trust as he does he's the example um there is a school of thought that jesus is to bring you up to the beginner level and there's a lot of truth in that so christos is not jesus but Jesus is modelled on him. Back in the time of Jesus, what it meant then is different from what it means today. Uh, often taken to mean gnosis, power and law, but may more accurately be thought of as the ability to create. To wit a type of wizardry. The text described the beast in the garden as being the wisest of all the beasts for the reason that he was best made. Therefore, wisdom throughout the NHL should be taken to mean that which is created and made. This is why the Demiurge can sometimes be said to have wisdom. So there you have it. Right, I'm asked, what is a vibration? Vibrations aren't actually in the NHL. It's just a level of consciousness is what a vibration is. But... There are resonances, but not vibrations in the spiritual sense. So that's what that is. So if my vibe is such that I want to learn all about the Nagamadi text, then my level of consciousness is such that I am, you know, uh, indulged in, in those things. That's my vibe at the moment, my uh, level of consciousness. So now the other one, uh, who asked me that? Um, where are we? Yeah. Two, two things. Holy Spirit. And generation. These are terms that are found extensively throughout the New and Old Testament. And they're also in the Nagamati text. They confuse people, but the difference is in the Nagamati text there is a clear definition of what those things are. So the Holy Spirit is female and Sophia. For instance, um, the Holy Spirit, I've defined it as the divine, divine female principal power of Sophia. Because if you look at all the contexts in which it's mentioned, that's the example that fits best. For instance, in the Gospel of Philip, paragraph 17, some said that Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. They are in error. They do not understand what they say. When did a woman ever conceive by a woman? Hence, the Holy Spirit is Sophia. And the other partly weasel word is generation and generations and when I was deciphering the Judas Codex 
there's a bit where Jesus appears, they're doing this service or this ceremony of observance, the disciples, and they ask him where he's been. And he says, I have been with the higher generations. I'm paraphrasing now because they're not in front of me. I've been with the higher generations. And they said, tell us of those higher generations. And he basically says, don't ask me about them because all you who are of this generation won't see them. And then I thought about that and I thought that can't be right. But once you substitute generation with the word creation, it takes on a completely different meaning. So many instances throughout the NHL, it's been used in place of creation, I think, because when I looked at the original text, creation's the more accurate word. Occasionally generation fits better, but very, very rarely. So you should really consider one or the other when encountering it in the authorized texts. So generation implies 25 year span of human existence and experience, whereas creation gives a wider implication as to the meanings one can derive um, from the library overall. So if you substitute it, and they, they, they're doing this ceremony and when he turns up he laughs and he, they get angry and he says to them, what is it in your soul that has angered you? The Judas Codex is quite clear as are the other texts, that the Archons create, um, no, it says the Archons control every human soul. That's one of the first lines in the Judas Codices, uh, Codex rather, but in the other Codexes or Codices, there are references to this, that they control the 360 and 365 of every human being, which is space and time. They are space conquerors, it says. So, in many instances, so when you look at that, he's quite rightly referencing the negative energy in their soul, which is put in there by the Archons. And they're basically celebrating a, a God that they have created for themselves. And that's what he says. So when he says, all you who are of this creation, he's referring to the ceremony, will not see the higher creation. So don't ask me about it until you can let this go. Jesus stands up to face him and can't do it, turns away. He says, I know where you're from now. You're from the realm of Barbello. And it's fascinating. I mean, I've, uh, I will get around to uploading some of these. So I hope that's made some sense to have a look at another question while I've got time. So staying with the Judas Codex, um, there's a part in it where Jesus takes him away and shows him things. And I, I think it's kind of um, what you might call, it's almost like a, a close encounter. He can see the remaining disciples beneath him on the earth, but he's shown the stars and the realms and he's told out of all these things, the cloud. Um, well, let, let me just refer to my notes. Cloud sometimes taken to mean the galactic cloud, I think. Because uh, when you look up, that's what you see, especially back then, you, you haven't got the light pollution that you have today. And dog to add, uh, the former being visible to the naked eyes, the Milky Way, the latter to the psychic eye. But in some codices such as Judas, it can also mean the generating womb from which all manner of aeons, gods and deities emerged. So, you know, maybe it's quite right that they came from space, as it were. Uh, it all depends on the context and the setting in which the term is used. So, when you look at the world card of the Major Arcana and its reference in chapter 19 to the celestial wheel and the formation of the constellations and the, the solar system, it talks about the cloud and things coming out of the cloud. And I think that's what it is that when you look up, it does look like a celestial cloud. Because I can't find any better fit for it. So that's my version. I'm sticking to it. So I know this has all been a little bit scatty, um, but I just hope I've answered some of the questions that I get asked. There are plenty others that I, I get asked and, and, you know, just don't always have the time. So.